Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is episode number 27 of The Right Take. I'm Eric Lendrum, and sorry, guys, Jacob is not here for this episode. He is out once again, taking once again some very well-deserved time off. So, Godspeed to Jacob. Hope you are enjoying the uh, undisclosed location where you are currently hiding out right now. And he will be back soon enough. In the meantime, once again, I am here to hold down the fort. And as much as I enjoyed the last solo episode I did on my excellent Red Pill adventure, we ultimately determined that I I just personally am not capable of continuing another episode by myself for however length of, that, length of time we may need. And riding off of the success of our very popular interview we did with Tom Papper two episodes ago, you guys should check that out, episode number 25, Editor-in-Chief of National File, if you've not already. We got great feedback. You guys loved it. He was very informative. He was funny. He's a great guy. We'll probably have him back on the show in the future. We are going to have another special surprise for you guys today. Our second ever guest. This is one I am really excited to have on. She is a reporter with Liberty Hangout, whom you guys may know more famously or infamously, depending on your definition, as the Kent State Gun Girl. She went viral in 2018 for her college graduation photos from Kent State University with a rifle on campus as well as her graduation cap decorated with the image of a gun and, of course, that iconic pro-Second Amendment phrase, come and take it. The one and the only Caitlin Bennett. Welcome to The Right Take. Thank you so much for having me. I am kind of nervous to have to follow up from Tom. He's great. We both know him personally. Both, I would say he's both friends of ours, so um, I'm a little nervous, but... We'll just have to get the feedback to see who wins here. <laughs> of course, of course. We we treat all our guests with equal respect and with equal admiration because we have the best guests on this podcast. We plan to have the best guests on this show. And we don't discriminate, all right? We respect women and we empower women here on The Right Take, contrary to popular <laughs> belief. So there, for those of you who don't know who she is, again, she is with the website Liberty Hangout, and you can find them on their various social media. And the Kent State gun girl photos, which, oh man, when, when these photos went viral, th this is the important thing I got to say. The th what I think, why I think you are so great and why you are so valuable to the conservative movement or to the right or whatever term we want to use is that from that, she has subsequently gone on to, as I said, she's a reporter with Liberty Hangout who specializes in what's known as man on the street videos, or if we're being a gender correct here, woman on the street videos, where she goes to a variety of locations all around the United States and asks various questions, usually about politics, civics, what have you. And of course, this is a formula. This is not an original formula. It was first, I think, in our times, it was started by Jesse Waters on Fox News back when Waters World was just a segment on the O'Reilly Factor. God, that feels like a lifetime ago. And subsequently, right. it has been done by others, including Will Witt at PragerU and Cabot Phillips at Campus Reform. But the thing with Caitlin, of course, first off, you know, not man on the street. She's a woman doing these videos. But further to the point, what I think is so great about these videos, I've seen plenty of your videos when you do this stuff. You don't just go to like a beach party in Florida or some college party and ask, you know, girls in bikinis about how many states there are and they answer 62, you know, and get dumb <laughs> answers because that that's what those other guys do. And those can be funny. Those can be entertaining for about five minutes. But you have gone several steps further when you do it. On several occasions, you have gone into the lion's den. You have gone to Antifa gatherings. You have <laughs> gone to presidential campaign rallies for Democrats, including Bernie Sanders and Pete Buttigieg. And the reaction I see you get and Feel free to talk about some of these craziest stories in a minute. The reactions you get just by being there and asking questions, the vitriol and the hate, the quantity and quality of how much these leftists just despise you. They will scream at you. They will openly threaten you to your face to kill you, to do very <laughs> inappropriate things to you. They have surrounded your motorca motorcades when you've arrived on campus and they've thrown things at you. And all this, I cannot think off the top of my head. Not counting President Trump because he's illegal all of his own. I can't think of someone who has done more to collectively make the left lose their minds, in my opinion, since Milo. I think you definitely live up to that standard of just the left goes nuts over what you say and how important and how correct the things you are saying. So tell us a little bit about how you got started with Liberty Hangout before and after the famous photos and subsequently some of the craziest things that have happened to you on campuses and elsewhere. Right. So a lot of people have a misconception that I created Liberty Hangout. I did not. It was created in 2015 by my now husband. I didn't even know him at the time. He didn't know me. 
But uh, he, we connected over Facebook one day and he asked me to write for Liberty Hangout, his website. And I was like, no, I don't read. I don't write. I'm not going to do all that, but I'll make videos if you want to. And so he came out uh, from New Jersey to Kent State and we filmed a couple of videos and it was super fun. Well, we ended up dating and he ended up moving out there with for me, actually moved from Jersey to Ohio for me. And he's the one that actually convinced me to take this picture. We did so much on our campus, Kent State's campus, while I was a student. And I really pushed back hard against the administration. I actually had a meeting with the Dean of Students uh, trying to convince me that I can't be racist on campus or else I'm going to be kicked out. And I just looked at him and he's a black guy. And I said, number one, I'm not racist. But number two, if I were, I'm allowed to do that on this campus. And he's like, well, there's parents calling in scared that you're a white supremacist. And I just looked at him and I said, I'm allowed to be one on this campus. I said, it's called free speech. I'm not one, but I'm not going to argue with you about that. And I think we'll talk about this later. That that's one of the problems the right has is they're so worried about what people think of them. Even before I did all of this, I did not care who thought I was a white supremacist, who, th- you know, who thought I was anti-gay. I was just like, I'm allowed to be. I'm allowed. And that's the, that, I think that's the angle we've got to go with, you know, continuing on with the right wing and conservatism or whatever. So eventually they made me so mad that I just kept pushing the campus. I kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And eventually I left Turning Point because they were not those type of people. They Right. You originally got started with Turning Point USA. And yes. that's that's a whole crazy story. But uh, carry yeah, on. Yeah, that is a whole nother crazy story. I left them, created my own Liberty Hangout chapter on campus. And we went out on my graduation day. And I took that picture to protest the administration, not to go viral not to get famous, not to get anything that came out of it. I simply wanted to send a message to the administration who tried to get me expelled three different times. And I think I did that. I think I sent a message to them, but I also sent a message message to everybody else. And since then, I could have let it die. I could have been 15 minutes of fame, um, you know, go out there, be a be a pro gun person. There's several different avenues I could have taken, but I'm so happy with the avenue that I did take is I'm not just someone who talks about guns now. I'm not just a David Hogg who talks about one position of guns. You're not going to start your own pillow company or anything, are you? I'm not. (laughs) I I can't say no. (laughs) After this experience with the damage on my hair that we talked about, I might be into satin pillowcases, though. Those are great. If there's any women watching, great for your hair if it's damaged, by the way. So maybe I'll start that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so basically I took a different approach with my career and I started talking about different topics now if you notice guns is, are actually the least thing the, the 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 lesser of the topic that I talk about I don't talk about guns that much I feel like I kind of got burnt out on it and now I stick to conservative values things that I think the right wing has been lacking on and I just stick to a traditional lifestyle. I have a really, really big hatred for the culture that we have let slip through our fingers. So that's what I focus on now. I don't even really remember what the question was or what I'm supposed to be talking about. <laughs> Just, it's just some of the uh, the craziest because at the height of the presidential election, you did go to campaign events for at least two Democrats. Yes. I know Bernie Sanders and Pete Buttigieg, and um, th- those were some. Well, one was decisively more hostile than the other, but they were both uh, interesting stories in their own right. Yes. So the Bernie Sanders one, if I if you're talking about the same one that I'm thinking about, I just sat in the stands to listen to him because I wanted to ask a question. And actually, they threatened to physically remove me if I did not leave his speech. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm not a journalist. I'm not a reporter. Like I'm I'm not. I'm just a YouTuber. And I hate the word influencer, whatever. Yeah. Oh, goodness. I'm, right. Like, I'm just a YouTuber. I'm not here to influence anybody, but if I do, great, it happens. They ejected me from this speech. And this is a man who wants to be my president. He he wanted my vote. He wants to be the president of the country in which I live in. And he ejected me from listening to his speech in person. So that was crazy. But I think my favorite 
was at the Pete Buddha Judge event, oh, where boy. this grown man just gets behind me and he starts flipping me off while I'm doing an intro to one of my videos. Because I take that man on the street approach, like you talked about, and I apply it when I'm at these rallies. So I will go and I'll do the same thing when I'm at all of these rallies and protests is I'm going to ask them all questions and I have a, I have a single theme to them, unless I'm trolling. Then I'll just go there to make them mad, which I do. <laughs> I, I, I do like doing in that. space. It's fantastic. But this old man, right. uh, just for context, he, he's an older man. He looks like he could have been in his 50s, honestly. Like he's a grown man. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So he was at least in his 40s and he had a son with him, uh, his teenage son. And they came up and they started cussing in my face. They took uh, water bottles out of my hands and they started throwing them. Uh, at the cam at my cameraman at the time when he worked with us and they started slapping me and then hero of the day out of nowhere comes this shirtless guy and he's like get away from them what are you doing Ch ch chill out chill out so uh you know he saved the day but in that moment i was just sitting there like what just happened because it happened so fast and he was so mad he was so violent mm -hmm. and that's a theme with Democrats. They are incredibly violent, no matter the age group. And I think that's something to recognize is that this isn't just affecting the younger generation that a lot of Gen Xers like to talk about, like, oh, you generation. No, it's everybody. I have oh, been yeah. attacked by every age group. Um, there is, it's just, it's just wild. It's wild that it happens. And then we went to the police about that. I actually was the one who found out his address. I found where he worked. I found where the son went to school. I found their emails. I found their phone numbers. And the police uh, closed the case and said that I requested it to be closed when none of that happened, and they refused to open it back up. So where was, very, where, very interesting. Where, where was this, by the way? Where did that happen? That had to be in Iowa. Oh, boy. Okay. so I don't know what city, because it's been so long ago, but they closed right. it and said that I requested it to be closed. They know I didn't, and they refused to open it back up. Yeah, and that really just shows, yeah, they are absolutely deranged. They will go out of their way to harass a young woman, and especially, you know, this guy was, he was a big guy. Like, he was taller. If I remember, he was a little bit on the slightly overweight side. Like, he was he was yes. a bigger guy. Like, yeah, so absolutely, literally, you know, the, the phrase pick on someone your own size until I forgot about that part about the shirtless dude who came up and just totally saved the day because he was even taller, and he was, like, built well. So, like, immediately the oh, guy yeah. backed down. So, it's, it's so oh, yeah. great. I, I love stories like that. That reminds me of that one, uh, Biden rally where the that 80 something year old guy who was a bigger guy but well built but 80 he looked a bit younger than that and he openly asked Biden to his face about like the hunter corruption and Biden is like you know you don't know you're a damn liar man how about I challenge <laughs> you to a push-up contest you don't have a very IQ he just laid into the guy and then afterwards a younger Biden voter a guy who looked probably in his 40s also like a bigger guy it goes up to the old man is like hey why don't you just get out of here and the old guy stands up and he's taller than the guy and the guy immediately backs down I, just, I love stuff like that they immediately when they are faced with someone their own size you know that's why you know when Antifa is you know terrorizing little girls you know like in Portland or something and beating up on Andy Nose they're all fine with it up until the Proud Boys show up and then they run scared so that's absolutely that's why my I now have a security team. I have one security manager slash bodyguard that I'm always with. He's like three of me combined. <laughs> I could swing like I'm on a jungle gym from his arms. They're huge. So that is, that I'm good. I'm protected. I have no, I, I don't filter myself anymore when I'm out uh, doing these types of videos because I know no one's going to touch me. <laughs> Exactly. That is the point of a good security team. If they're doing their job right, then no one will mess with you. So Absolutely. you have, of course, you were in college very recently. Again, we were talking uh, before we started recording. You graduated a year before, a year after I did. You graduated in 2018. I graduated in 2017. And you have gone to college campuses to give some of your uh, to talks or to do your recordings and whatnot. And something that's very important, this is, of course, a question from Jacob. I am asking this question on Jacob's behalf. Uh, obviously, one of the big topics being talked about pretty much ever since Biden seized power is critical race theory. This, which is just the fancy pseudo intellectual term for for racism against white people. That's basically what it is. It's white people bad. America is fundamentally racist. That's all it is. And this, of course, it's been widespread now to the point we have talked about this on the podcast and it's been covered elsewhere. It's now in our military. It is being taught in little like children's picture books. It's absolutely disgusting. But this started in colleges. This started on the college campuses. I witnessed it and I'm sure you witnessed it. Um, what were some examples you saw back when you were a student of at the time what we didn't know was critical race theory, but was critical race theory, anti-white racism and all that fun stuff? 
Well, right when I started this podcast with you, I explained how I got brought in by the dean of students to lecture me about my views. And none of my views were based on race, but because they could apply them to a type of racist perspective, I got branded as a racist. And what's funny is that now that I look back, I noticed a lot of things that were not okay when I was in school. I noticed a lot of things being pushed at my direction, um, most notably was my architecture professor. I was supposed to be learning about the Taj Mahal, but instead he started going on a rant about how, how dare women even want to be pro-life? How could you not be pro-choice as a woman? And no, that doesn't have anything to do with race, but it was a good setup for us to know where he is politically, because then came the Black Lives Matter discussions. The very first time that I stepped foot on campus uh, as a student and I went to an org fair, Black Lives Matter students came out and they dominated the center of campus. They formed a circle. And if you dared to walk past them, through them or around them, and you did not kneel or put your fist up or acknowledge them, you were branded as a racist on that campus. This was also upheld by a lot of professors. They had Black Lives Matter stuff in their windows. Uh, they would try to teach all this stuff. Even in my Spanish class, they had this type of, uh, who was it? I forget who it was. But they were promoting, I think it was Che Guevara at one point. They were oh, yeah. promoting him in, in the textbook. And I went up to the teacher afterwards and I said, what are you doing? I said, "What? what is this? And I had a conversation with her and she kind of just didn't know what was going on. She was like, I don't know. It's just the textbook. And I'm like, well, all of this is central to what we've been talking about. And I think it's kind of the fault of the right here. This has been going on on campuses for a long time. It starts with the language in which we use to talk to each other. Language has meaning. And when we start letting the left dominate our language, it dominates our conversations and therefore it dominates our culture. And that's the thing. This has been happening in schools for a while because, and I sincerely believe this, the right has always taken the position of, well, it's free speech for everybody. So if they want to teach critical race theory, that's fine. It's just we can't limit their speech as long as they don't limit ours. I just want to be left alone. Everybody can just do what they want. The left doesn't play by that game. They don't play by the same set of rules because they won't leave us alone. So they get in the, in the education system and they do what they want. They create policies on campus. They create language centers on campus and they create safe spaces on campus to let other people know that their language is not tolerated. So honestly, I genuine, genuinely believe this is our fault. Critical race theory has always been around. It's just now that we're being woken up to it on the right, we put a label on it. It's always been around. But now that people are learning that we don't play by the same set of roles, we're gonna put a label on it and freak out. Where were we 20 years ago when this was still happening? But instead, Republicans were too worried about getting that deregulation and that tax, you know, that tax cut. Where were you focusing on our country and our schools to make sure that our American students weren't being indoctrinated with this stupid stuff? Because it goes into math. There is no classroom. There is no topic that is just critical race theory. It's intertwined with every single subject, including math, if you can believe it or not. <laughs> oh, yeah. You walk into that uh, classroom and the professor is immediately talking about, you know, Black Lives Matter and abortion. And you respond and you ask the question, how does this, what does this have to do with architecture? And the professor says, architecture? <laughs> it's just like these people yeah, absolutely. What? We're here for architecture? <laughs> I, I, my mistake. No, but you're absolutely right. This is uh, spot on. The right did fail to address this when it was happening decades ago. It has been said, people have been saying for a long time, this was going on for quite a while, that arguably as far back as at least the 60s when the hippie flower children finally put down their protest signs and their flowers and they stopped protesting Vietnam, they went into the universities and they became professors. And this has been going yes. on for decades. And you made two very good points, especially that the it's about the language, of course, which is super important. That That is why we are now at this point in our society where the very idea of there being more than two genders is now basically mainstream on the left. When five years ago, that was idiotic. No one believed for a second there were more than two genders, male and female right. or sex or whatever the term is. 
but now it's like, oh, according to Facebook, there's 72.5 different genders and it's just, <laughs> and they unironically run with this. And what this ties back into, I think, is as you said, the left, want the right just wants to be left alone, you know, live and let live. The left wants to destroy us. And that has been the problem with the rights mentality for so long. What some are only just now realizing is you have clearly two very different sides. This is no longer, you know, oh, Ronald Reagan, like famously said, oh, our well-meaning liberal friends, you know, that was a phrase I think he used. This idea, oh, Democrats, Republicans all want the same thing. They all want what's best for America. They just have different means of achieving it. No, no, no. For at least the last couple decades or a few decades, give or take, the left and the right have fundamentally different views of America. The right loves America. We're patriotic. We love our founding fathers and our Bill of Rights and all that good stuff. Proud to be Americans. And the left thinks this country is evil and racist. And the people who built it and their descendants today, white Americans, are inherently racist. And it has been said before, I think Scott Adams was the first person to say this, to which I had seen it. He made this very good point. I think he was talking about the Israel-Palestine conflict, but I think it works here just as well. Whenever you have two sides that want the exact same thing and will not allow the other side to have it, that conflict will never end until and unless one side destroys the other. And the left gets that. And the right is only recently kind of finally starting to get that as well. Well, what they don't get, and I was just talking about this with my husband, is that if we were to ask somebody, what is the what is a value or a moral standard held by an average American? There isn't any because we don't have values in this country. Now, if you go off to Japan, they have values as in their culture. They are very career driven. They're very independent. And that's kind of why their suicide rates are so high, because they don't flourish out and they don't have a lot of social connections. They're very, you know, just to themselves. But that is their culture over there. You don't speak to people you by yourself. Here, what is a value that we have in this country? We have so many different types of people. We have so many different ideas. But most importantly, we don't play by the same playing field like I was just telling you. One of the biggest things that people in this country have focused on are our rights. Instead of thinking about what is right, we are just more concerned about our rights. And that's why I I can't stand libertarians. I used to call myself <laughs> one because I used to think that everybody could just get along. And if we all just respected each other's property, that we could all just get along in whatever. That's not the case. They don't want to be left alone and they don't want to leave you alone. Me, I used to be okay with thinking, oh, I'll just leave you alone if you leave me alone. And now I'm on I'm on their playing field. I don't want to be left alone and I don't want to leave you alone. You're absolutely right. I mean, for context, especially you said it was not even 10 years ago. It was eight years ago now. Obergefell v. Hodges, literally one of the worst Supreme Court decisions in American history. And this is this is a great way to to make everybody feel old and realize how quickly things change. Ten years ago, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton were both against gay marriage. And now look where we are. The legalization of gay marriage led straight to everything we are seeing now with drag queen story hours. And they're mainstreaming this, especially when you see pride parades. You know, at pride parades, fine, whatever. But how many little kids are at these pride parades as these men walk by in thongs with giant um, rainbow <clears throat> sex toys? And it's just, it's disgusting. And like, that is public indecency. Ten years ago, that would have been outlawed, as it should have been. You, little kids should not be exposed to this. Because when you were teaching kids about homosexuality or gender identity, transgender, whatever... What is the basis of all these things? What is the basis of homosexuality? What's the basis of transgenderism? It's what you are doing with other people in bed. You know, it's about sex. And I don't know about you, but little kids should not be learning about sex. They absolutely, when they're three years old, they should not have any idea. They're, they're not old enough to understand this stuff yet. It's just, but that is the what they're doing here. It's the push for autonomy among minors. The idea, oh yes, my seven-year-old child can't drink, they can't drive, they can't vote, they can't have a gun. Some parents won't even let those kids have, you know, smart devices or whatever, they're too young. They cannot do all of these things. They can't serve in the military, but they're old enough to change their gender without the parents' consent. That is disgusting. And what some people have said, and I do ultimately agree with the final assessment, their end goal with that, with increasing sexual autonomy among minors, is the eventual normalization and legalization of pedophilia. But that, and that may Thank not come you. for a while, but yeah, you agree? 
Yes, absolutely. I have said this for a while now. You know what? I, I don't even, I don't know what you think about this. Someone that the right has to stop propping up is Blair White. If we can see this idea and we follow people and we prop them up and we clap when they, you know, w when they say something good or, or we promote them as, oh, this is a transgender, but they're not radical. I want to go back to, because again, that also ties into the culture thing. Now, this culture of Anthony Fauci, this culture of Pride Month and all this stuff. What we said earlier, it started on the college campuses. That was where it got started. As soon as the flower children, the Bill Ayers types, they went in and became college professors and they taught, they indoctrinated whole new generations. And again, we both recently graduated college, recent quote unquote, you know, four, four years ago for me, three years ago for you. <laughs> what are some ways that you ultimately think we could probably, what are some solutions to the campus problem and certainly and solutions that are not being used or not being expressed or even hinted at by others, by, uh, shall we say, your contemporaries, websites like Liberty Hangout or publications that try to do what Liberty Hangout does, but are not doing it as effectively. So I 100% I believe that we have to get away from this mindset of wanting to be left alone. That's like where it all goes back to. We on the right, we really believe in individualism mm -hmm. and we really believe in, you know, the, the greatest, the greatest person and the greatest entity out here is the individual. And if we just respect individual rights, then everything will be good. We have to break away from that mindset and we have to start viewing our society as bigger than ourselves. And when we look at the bigger picture, it affects us on an individual level. It affects our children on an individual level because you are not the only influence on your children's minds. We have to break away from that. We have to branch out to our family members. We have to branch out to our community. We have to get involved. And this is something that the right is learning. Although it's too late and I don't think it'll make a difference, the school board, stuff like that. And it, it doesn't even just start on college campuses. It starts with the public education system, K through 12 in America. That's where it starts. The campuses are later, but it really starts in the public education K through 12. We learned way too late and we see it right now because of the mask stuff and, and, and the critical race theory stuff that there are viral videos going around of people, parents and students getting up in front of the school board members and saying, I don't want this, this or this. This is not what you're going to do. Blah, blah, and I demand it 100 percent all the way. Although I do believe you should probably homeschool your children. I don't believe in, in public education. Don't send your kids there. Uh, you should homeschool them. But I think that that's really what it comes down to. We have to get rid of this individualist nature. We have to branch out and we have to stop being afraid of indoctrinating. Indoctrination is not a bad word. Indoctrination is okay. Indoctrination is just another word for education. Someone is going to indoctrinate the kids. Someone's going to do it. It might as well be us. It might as well be us and it might as well be on a Christian and conservative outlook because the things that we believe in when we say liberty and the liberty for everybody to do what they want, that's not liberty. We're still slaves. We're slaves to our desires. We're slaves to our sins. We're slaves to our wants and needs and our inability to contain ourselves. That's not being free. It's not called being free. If we are still slaves to just being able to go out and do whatever we want and not care about the consequences. And this is a whole nother episode that I get, can get into. And my husband is so much better at explaining that than I am. But we just have to get out of that mindset. Someone's going to indoctrinate the kids. It might as well be you and it might as well be us and our values. Our values have never been wrong for society. When we go back, you know, a few decades back before the sexual revolution, we had a traditional and gendered type of way of living. We had women with their roles, men with their roles. And we find that in other countries, and especially Scandinavia, and Jordan Peterson talks about this a lot, that when you try to limit gender differences and biological differences between men and women, when you try to level the playing field and we don't have really a, a difference between men and women, the differences end up being exacerbated, becomes even becomes more 
than countries that do try to push gender roles because that's our nature. It's our nature to push women to be feminine. It's our nature to push men to be masculine, toxic masculinity. I love it. <laughs> I think it's great. Uh, I want men in this country to be strong and powerful, and I want women to be not weak, but I want them to be vulnerable to let a man protect them and have trust in men in this country, and we don't have that. And I genuinely believe, and I'll touch on the uh, the campus thing since that's specifically what you asked for. If you are in cam- or if you are in college right now, you have to be unafraid to go out and promote your ideas because someone is going to take that spotlight, and it's probably going to be someone from the left. Take the spotlight before someone else on the other side can get to it. Be loud, be crazy, and get get attention. And I mean, I love that stuff. You know me, I will go on a college campus, I'll put a man in a diaper and I won't care. I think it's crazy. People pay attention to you when you do outrageous things. That's why the left is so powerful because they get people to listen to them. And if you want to be a professor, go ahead. But talking about the college problems, I don't know if you're asking me from like a student perspective. I genuinely think you just got to go out there and be unafraid. Don't fall for the language tactics that they use against us and understand what's at stake. You're being censored right now on online and on big tech platforms. You aren't censored on your college campus. You have a voice out there. It's just talking to regular people. It's the most powerful thing you can do. And presumably, once you do start getting your views out there, you may very well find that for all the hate and all the protesters you may get, you very well may get other students, the so-called silent majority, as it were, who will agree with you privately and be like, oh, well, thanks for going out there and saying what I wanted to say, but didn't have the courage to say. I get that all the time. And my number one rule since I've began doing this and since before I was the gun girl and, and had a following, I don't care about changing minds. I don't care. I don't want to bring the left over to my side because they never agreed with my values anyway. I do. I hate the walkaway movement. I do. I don't like them at all. They're watering down conservatism. They're watering down what it means for the Republican Party to go out there and fight the culture war. They're... I can go on about that later because that'll be a whole other thing. I hate the walkaway movement so much. I don't care about them. I don't care about changing their mind. I want people who already think like me and value the same things I do to be inspired to stand up for themselves. And that's been my goal. I think that's why I'm different than Cabot Phillips and the Will Witts and the other man on the streets, because I don't care about changing minds. I just want other people to stand up for themselves. Yeah, and that's super important. Everything you just said is completely true. Again, in our previous episode, Jacob and I talked about the downfall of California slash the California Republican Party. And one of the problems they did is they fell into this trap, which is still being promoted to this day. There was a New York Post article the other day by a college student, a 21-year-old college student, a member of Gen Z, who openly argued that, you know, oh, Republicans just need to embrace transgenderism and admit that global warming is real and they'll get the Zoomer vote. (laughs) And I said, that's the problem. That's the California Republican Party problem is they believe, oh, if we just move further to the left and be like Democrats, then we'll convince people to vote for us. And again, the, the obvious response is, So if you're just going to be Democrat light, why wouldn't potential Democrat to Republican voters just vote for the real thing? Why vote for a fake ripoff? And they don't seem to get it. They think that continuing to modernize and move to the left is the answer when it clearly is not. We should not compromise our values, especially when our country is at stake. And like you said, you're speaking my language when you say we need to ditch individualism because, again, this is the Cold War dilemma for half a century We were the capitalists. We were the West. We were the opposite of those dirty commie bastards. And we had to be the exact opposite to defeat them, which was important. Killing the Soviet Union was important. Defeating global communism was the most important thing. And we succeeded. We did it. But after that, we, okay, there is no dominant rival superpower. It's no longer a dichotomy between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. It's just us. And for 10 years, of course, we basically, as some people say, the 90s was a break from history. For 10 years, we kind of didn't know what to do with ourselves. And then, of course, we get hit out of nowhere on 9-11. And after that, we still continued. We, of course, turned the focus to foreign problems with the war on terror. But we still were not sure how to deal with our domestic issues, and especially when it came to the economy and capitalism. And this is something Tucker has pointed out. There are problems with the right when it comes to economics and you can point them out from a right-wing perspective you can criticize 
the so-called free market that led to the rise of these tech monopolies and this woke corporate culture that I, I refer to as corporate fascism that basically has more control over our society than the government does. They're promoting yes. Pride Month. They're promoting Black Lives Matter. They promoted the, lo Only the year lockdowns. Only Exactly. Yes. One of the three things that defines the Zoomer generation, in my opinion, along with Fortnite and TikTok. Um, but that's a discussion for a whole other day. Right. And we should do something about it. We should maybe, okay, maybe breaking up monopolies and with the power of the government is not the conservative free market thing to do, but it's the right thing to do. But of course, thank the, you. But of course, the Paul Ryans will all say, oh, no, and the Ben Shapiro's just let the free market work everything out and the free market will handle all of our problems. OK, well, the free market got us to where we are. And the longer we just keep punting on genuine problems created by our more or less by our system, like the student loan crisis or certainly the recession we had then the more eventually independent voters will take a look at the Republicans and finally throw their hands up and say, all right, you have no solutions. Let's turn around and give the socialists a chance. And then they vote for the socialists and we all know where that goes. So when we ditch individualism and we acknowledge we should do things for the good of the country, because like Tucker has said, we should start viewing our country more like a family. Our fellow countrymen are yeah. our family in a way because we ideally we share the same values. We are American citizens. Yes, we're citizens, so illegals don't count. And when we think more collectively, being collective is not bad. Collectivism itself is not bad. Yes, communism is the most drastic Thank form. You. Of, dr communism is the most drastic form of collectivism. So, of course, people will say collectivism taken too far is bad, and it is. But being American is a form of collectivism. Being a fan of a certain football team is a form of collectivism. Being a member being of a political a party. Being a family. Exactly. Is collectivism. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It, and I, didn't mean, I didn't mean to cut you off, but no, my by, by husband, means. he tweeted out that the fall of America and why we have no values is because we're too individualistic. We only care about ourselves. And people just went after him and me because they think that I run the Liberty Hangout Twitter. I do not. I'll just put that out there real quick. I do not run that. Uh, but they started calling him a commie, anti-American. It's, it's like, how can I be promoting a collectivist culture and be anti-American at the same time. These are people who have always been told that being a patriot and loving America is being selfish and loving yourself first and not caring about the person down the street. And this is the best example that I can put out there. While a lot, of, I'll, I'll call them patriots, while that's a boomer term, I'll, I'll call them patriots because that, that's what they call themselves. They stand by this notion that I'll do what I want. And just like I said earlier, and you guys go do what you want. Just leave me alone. I love individualism, rugged individualism. Well, the problem with that is if you leave the guy down the road alone who is dressing up like a woman and going out to the BLM stuff and letting him into the schools, into the libraries, sure, he has an individual right to do all those things. He can be left alone and be free to do all those things. You don't have to participate. But the problem with not being in a collectivist mindset is that you've now allowed him to take his collectivist mindset and cater it to children, cater it to the masses and convince the corporations. If we all along had taken the approach, this collectivist approach to our values, our morals, what we wanted for this country, and we did the same things the left did, the behaviors, the propaganda, uh, the push in schools and the push for corporations and the boycotting. If we did that with our values, I think that we might be more successful than them because we mean something and people are happier when they abide by the rules and the values that conservative Christians set forth. They're happier that way. Uh, that's why their, their, you know, their propaganda and their way of doing things, they've gotten everybody to agree with them. They've gotten the corporations to agree with them. They've gotten the government to agree with them. Uh, the issue with that is that it leads to violence because it doesn't make people happy. It's not liberty, it's slavery, and it's just a different type. Exactly, exactly. You got to, as Breitbart, as Andrew Breitbart himself always said, politics is downstream from culture. And there, yes. are, there are many ways to try to tackle this because obviously it's going to take a long time. It will take decades to try to reverse Hollywood and those. Do you think it can be reversed? I, I think, I think nothing is impossible. I don't, I, here's the thing. If the, you know me fairly well and Tom and others know me, I 
am nev I will never be black pilled. All right. I I like to think of myself as white pilled. I I like to be optimistic and say, absolutely, there is still a chance. I mean, just think back. You know, again, think back to our founding, our revolution, that the Americans, a small group of colonists, and not even what, not even. 10% of colonists, I think, were even involved in the revolution, and yet fighting guerrilla warfare tactics, they defeated the largest empire in human history. So, and I know times are different, obviously, but right. I like to think nothing is entirely impossible. And the Trump election certainly did show that. And I do think back to your point, the, the idea of the right becoming collective, Trump rallies. You look, even the one he had just last night at the time of recording this last night, his first post uh, presidential rally in Ohio, thousands of people that you can see the capabilities that the right does have the capacity to mass organize, whether it's for Trump rallies or stop the steel rallies or whatever, we can be collective and we can and should push back. And certainly with these the revolutions against the school boards, as you said, I agree hundred percent parents who are doing these videos and going viral and teachers even who are standing up against it should run for school boards themselves. We should run for these yeah. local positions. That is how you begin to maybe turn the tide and push things back a little bit. But uh, once people realize the severity of what is at stake here, of that they really do mean they want, as Barack Obama said, a fundamentally transformed nation, which is to say yeah. not really America. They want something entirely different from what America was when it was founded over 200 years ago. I kind of feel like our country was founded on like the, the anarcho weirdos of today because they had a, a very different vision from what other countries have been. And I do, I feel like they were kind of anarchists in a way. And as we see, it really I don't, did it work out very well. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure if it worked out very well. Uh, this whole democracy thing isn't working out too well. And that's a whole nother discussion for another time. Justin recently tweeted out on uh, Liberty Hill's Twitter. He's saying authoritarianism is not bad if it's used for the right reasons. And people are like, oh, I can't believe you. I'm kind of down that road. That is a spi and, another spicy take, but by all means, go ahead. <laughs> I'm kind of going down that road because the alternative has been just absolute nonsense, absolute just degeneracy, and I'm not I'm not okay with it. I'm just not okay with it. I'm totally okay with banning a lot of things and putting people in jail for a lot of different things because it's very, very cancerous to our society. That's a whole nother conversation, which we could get into on and the next time I'm on because I owe you a, a video chat uh, <laughs> yeah. that you can actually see my face. Of, but, course, um, of course, of course. No, and they're clearly, we yeah. have touched on a lot of stuff that would make for a great uh, return episode when you come back because there's there's just so much to unpack with what you just said because what you point out is, you know, that democracy has not been going well. And again, we're technically a republic, but over the last at least over 100 years, we have shifted more to a democracy. Certainly the 17th Amendment, the alterations to how U.S. senators were elected was a huge mistake that never should have been allowed to happen. Um, and yeah, the idea that they just give votes to as many to give Votes to felons, give votes to illegal aliens, and well, look where right. that's getting us, right? So it's, it's well, getting democracy worse. is a big umbrella, and there's different types of democracy. In a constitutional republic, it is a democracy. And I think that's one of the things that uh, the people on the right have a, have a big misconception about is we're not a democracy, we're a republic. We are a type of democracy, and that's the issue. If you have to sit there and say, no, 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 we're not a democracy, we're this, this, and this then democracy isn't good then if you don't want to be called that. Well, guess what? We are a democracy and it hasn't worked out too well. I'd be totally okay. I'm not even going to say it because I can't I can't elaborate with the amount of time we have left. So I'm not even going to say it because someone will take me out of context. Uh, but yeah, you know, I'll, I'll end on this. People complain that the right is being radicalized and who's radicalizing all these people? To the leftists out there, you did this to me. You radicalized me. You guys are the ones that are radicalizing millions of people in this country because you are so disgusting and abhorrent and just completely opposite of what I'd want to see in my country. So I've been radicalized. You're hearing it here first. This is my first. Op I'm coming out 
on your podcast as a radical, and I've been radicalized, and it's the left's fault. <laughs> the right take exclusive. Caitlin Bennett admits to being a radical, radical because because of the left. And no, you you are one hundred percent right. And movies again. This is why I love the movie Joker, which some say took some pages out of Falling Down, another great movie that. Ordinary people will be driven to do just extraordinary things when society just keeps beating them down. You know, it's been said, reasonable men sometimes are driven to do unreasonable things. Or in this case, reasonable women are sometimes driven to do supposedly unreasonable things because of how society is treating us. When you have institutions saying, oh yeah, an entire race of people in the United States are automatically racist by virtue of their skin color, when you have an entire news media declaring that cities burning down all across the country are peaceful protests, when you have a government locking people down for a whole year, shutting down their livelihoods, their schools, yes. their social lives, their businesses, but that- it's, is like, it's like gaslighting. It's gaslighting on a national level. They poke and they poke and they poke, and then when someone- tries to stand up to them, it's, how dare you? Why would you treat us this way? Why are you being so unreasonable? Gosh, I was just saying that maybe you're racist, okay? And it's like, no, no, you haven't. It, it, I have a laundry list of things that I've been told are wrong with me over the past six years. And now that I finally wanna take a stand and, and demand something for myself and my country, now I'm being blamed. So. No, it's gaslighting to the extreme, and um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where it goes from here, but I don't know if I'm more black pilled than you. I think I might be. You probably are. Again, I like to remain optimist, but <laughs> I, I, I am not convinced that America is done yet, and the MAGA movement and what Trump started is certainly. I think. The election of Trump was just the beginning and the cultural shift that we are seeing now with these viral videos of parents standing up. That the one silver lining of the pandemic, or one of the silver linings was that they got to see what is going on in the schools, not just in colleges, but in elementary schools and in middle schools. They got to see firsthand what is happening via virtual learning, and now they are revolting, and it is fantastic. So we will see. We will see what the future holds for American society. Is this truly the beginning of our Rome-style downfall, or are we going to have an American renaissance, the likes of which we have not seen in modern times? That is, of course, to be seen. But until then, we will continue to cover all these latest breaking developments and continue to feature wonderful guests like Caitlin Bennett, who we have just been talking to for over an hour. I want to thank you again, Caitlin, so much for coming on The Right Take. And go ahead and uh, you've already introduced yourself well enough to our listeners. Let them know where can they follow you and your work. So the most, I would say the most important platform because I have several, is just YouTube. That's where we post all of our content. And I also have an uncensored site called libertyhangout.tv. Um, it's a su subscription-based site because I am not beholden to any sponsors or anything. So everything I uh, make is from all of my listeners, people who support me. Uh, that's where I go to really express myself. So thank you so much for having me on and letting me plug that. And this was really fun. I agree. This was definitely a lot of fun. We look forward to probably having you back on our podcast in the future once Jacob is back and then the three of us can have a great discussion. So until then, stay tuned for the latest updates from us here at The Right Take on possible future guests that we will be having on in the coming weeks. And follow all of our other content and posts at our website, righttakepodcast.com, and all of our various social media where we are available. We are on Telegram. We are on Gab. We are on Minds. We are on Facebook and YouTube, as well as BitChute and Rumble, and follow us at righttakepodcast.com slash subscribe for the full list of podcast platforms and social media and alt tech platforms where we are available. We'll talk to you next week, guys.